paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Nick Bryant podcast. Today, my guest is Jay Dyer, and he wrote two books called Esoteric Hollywood and also Esoteric Hollywood 2, which I found to be very edifying. Like no other book before it, his works delve deep into the dark, mysterious undertones hidden in Tinseltown. After years of scholarly research, Jay Dyer has compiled his most read essays, combining philosophy, comparative religion, symbolism, geopolitics, and all kinds of other dark subject matter. Readers will watch movies with new eyes, able to decipher on their own as the secret meetings of cinema are unveiled. Jay, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Uh, thank you, Nick. I know we've been talking for a long time about doing a podcast, and uh, we finally got around to doing it. Um, and I want to have you come on uh, my channel as well and discuss some of your work. I'll be more than happy to. So you get into a lot of esoteric stuff. I read uh, Esoteric Hollywood too, um, but you get into a lot of esoteric stuff in your writing. I think where you where you really go below the surface to show an esoteric occult side. Um, but with these two movies, they're kind of no-brainers as far as the occult side, and you could talk about them. Um, in your esoteric Hollywood 2, you say littered with Masonic and alchemical imagery, The Ninth Gate is a film about occult initiation, as much as I argued Kubrick's one Eyes Wide Shut is. So let's talk about The Ninth Gate and Eyes Wide Shut. Yeah, those are good uh, two pairs. They go together. They're very close uh, in terms of timeline when they came out or within a few years of one another. There's a lot of similar uh, scenes going on. So, um, you know, I don't know what type of relationship Kubrick or Roman Polanski had if they, if they knew each other very well. But both scenes, you know, or both films have the themes of uh, sort of a cult initiation, satanic groups running and things in the background, reaching to very high levels of uh, nobility and, and uh, you know, European dynasties and, uh, you know, these sort of quests that the protagonist is on to figure out what's really going on, who's running this stuff, what's, what's a true satanic initiation or a true uh, satanic philosophy. Um, I think, but but of course, they diverge in very distinct ways as well. They're very different films uh, in other respects. But yeah, I think you probably couldn't think, uh, I couldn't think of two better examples of, you know, occult Hollywood films other than Ninth Gate and Eyes Wide Shut. So in the first book, I devoted, I think about 180, 90, 100 pages to Kubrick. And uh, I think the the first significant essay is the Eyes Wide Shut essay I put a lot of time and effort into to studying that film particularly uh, about eight or nine years ago because I was in college and taking film classes <clears throat> and we had a class on Oliver Stone that's actually what kind of uh, introduced me to a lot of uh, try and day books I, I ended up coming across um, the Sinister Forces trilogy I read the whole trilogy and that kind of piqued my interest as well as other books I'd read on the connections between Hollywood cults and intelligence agencies. And there hadn't been a whole lot of mainline literature at that time. You could really only find a few academics like Trisha Jenkins and uh, Donald, uh, I forget the guy's name, but there's a book called Operation Hollywood. And, and those really kind of just scratch the surface when it comes to the Pentagon and the CIA having kind of liaison offices to <laughs> consult on various film projects. Um, but I really wanted to go deeper into, you know, well, it seems like quite a few of these actors have pretty consistent intelligence connections. It seems like some famous people uh, in Hollywood have even been spies uh, at, at a high level, uh, A-listers even. 
So the more that I dove into it, uh, you just, you, it turns out there's a whole rabbit hole of information about the connection between these realms. And I think certain movies also are really uh, windows into that world as well. And these two, these two films are great examples. It's interesting. Oliver Stone's kid, Sean Stone, uh, mm -hmm. made a documentary about the, uh, the propaganda that Hollywood kicks out about the medical industrial complex. And uh, I was interviewed in that, series actually it was two documentaries and uh i thought it was very elucidating so with kubrick he he's born in the bronx does all right as a photographer starts to do really well as a director and he goes to the uk and kind of lives almost uh, he's he's very insulated and I've always wondered about that. And then he comes out with Eyes Wide Shut. And what's really interesting about that, the first time I saw it, it was before I got into the Franklin scandal and all the other crazy stuff that I write about. And it didn't, I, I just, it, it wouldn't have gotten more than 35 or 40 on the tomato meter for me, Rotten Tomato. Right. But after I got into Franklin and this other stuff, I went, Wow he is capturing a reality yes. that no one has yet captured in the way that he has captured it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think, uh, you know, I remember hearing about your work uh, many years ago when I heard about other texts that uh, books that, dis that discussed uh, similar types of, you know, really gruesome subject matter. And I think in the last maybe even eight years, as more and more of these types of things came out with, uh, Epstein or with uh, Saville in the UK, we started to see this pattern that, um, you know, this isn't really conspiracy theory. This is a lot of fact. And it's an unfortunate, you know, way that governments work, which is to utilize compromise and to be involved in these kinds of high level, uh, you know, escapades and, and parties and whatnot and filming it and all of that. And then, so it, it would just, it just seemed logical to me that if Kubrick has made, for example, underage, uh, stuff and compromise. He's actually made that a theme in many of his films, right? Going back to Lolita, going back to Barry Lyndon. Um, it just seemed logical to me that when we dissect something like Eyes Wide Shut, we're going to notice the same types of patterns. We're going to see, you know, uh, uh, the the shop, uh, the the costume shop owner, right? He's got uh, Lily Sobieski there playing the role of this underage girl who seems to kind of know what what's going on in this this operation. Because she's the one that, of course, tells Bill Harford to wear an, uh, an ermine cloak, which signifies uh, nobility, royalty, upper class in the traditional European uh, uh, idea. So so she knows what's going on. We see this with her characters, just one example. And uh, yeah, I think that yeah, that's, again, why it's emblematic of, you know, Kubrick was kind of like you said, he, he may have been exposed to some of this uh, upper class stuff, so to speak, when he was in the U.K., um, and then he puts it into this film. People at the time thought the film was kind of crazy. I remember at the time when it came out, I was, I've always been a film buff. So I remember reading reviews and it was, it was lampooned. And it was just like, this is it's boring. It doesn't make sense. It's irrelevant. Uh, but as time has gone by, I think he's been vindicated that it does make sense. I agree with that hundred percent. More and more people that I've talked to understand eyes wide shut as the occult and various initiation rites are kind of starting to just merge with the mainstream or basically um on on the verge of merging with the with the mainstream and then you got into they live which is a very interesting movie and i've always liked it it's about a guy who sees reality when he's living in the matrix basically extraterrestrials have taken over the world and then they've made everybody uh, Stepford husbands and Stepford wives and Stepford kids. But this one guy can see it. And um, you say of They Live, amazingly, Carpenter's film even reveals the, the core psyop of Hollywoodism, that the narcissistic indulgence of fame and the camera lens can bring fulfillment palpably demonstrated in the television scene with the woman describing her fantasy of being famous and thereby attaining meeting in her life. Yeah, I think uh, 
Carpenter's interesting. I've always liked John Carpenter's movies. I, I think the film is an allegory. Uh, I don't, <clears throat> as far as I know, Carpenter doesn't believe in any sort of supernatural or any kind of alien type of existence. So I think he's using the imagery of the alien as kind of a symbolic allegorical description of the ruling class and the tendency that they have to undermine us in ways that we wouldn't expect, even to the point of perhaps even uh, utilizing signals and signals intelligence and EMF, ELF, VLF stuff that we don't even know about probably in, in the mainstream um, at a very high level. And I, I think there's some truth to that. I'm not trying to go full crazy person, but I mean, there, there are, you know, military studies, research into that kind of stuff. So I think probably um, Carpenter had heard of that kind of, of, a, of a weapon uh, that existed or that weaponization going on. And then he expands it into the consumer culture, into uh, to mass media. And so I've always appreciated directors and writers that use the medium that they that they use as a means to critique that very medium. Right. So, you know, when we talk about the, the military industrial complex or Hollywood uh, being connected to the CIA, excuse me, CIA being, and military industrial complex being connected to Hollywood and, and music even what we start to see is that it's for a reason. It's not, it's not just trying, trying to make a quick buck. It's actually a, a huge part of social engineering. So like at the beginning of the second book, I cited the, the national security cinema book where they talked about thousands of declassified or hundreds of pages of, of, of documents that were declassified discussing tons and tons of TV shows, hundreds of examples and movies where you know the pentagon the deep state had had uh specific messages placed into those films so even things as innocuous as cupcake wars or hawaii 50 i mean it goes way back you've got the the messaging going on for the purpose of defending the overall uh superstructure of the regime and i can think even when i was a kid uh, <clears throat> my dad was in the navy and i remember all the navy movies that came out in the 1980s uh top gun <clears throat> You know, and there was Navy SEALs with Charlie Sheen and there's all this Navy propaganda, military propaganda. That was because you know, Reagan really at that time wanted to beef up uh, uh, America's defenses and, and the, the national security state. Right. Um, and he did that on purpose. And that that was there was a lot of tie in with the Pentagon at that time or between Hollywood and the Pentagon at that time on purpose. So even though we typically think of Hollywood as leftist, there can also be these phases where there's a lot of militarization, military propaganda as well. And that was kind of a overturning of the previous era of a lot of, you know, Oliver Stone style films or war films critiquing Vietnam and war films critiquing, you know, Apocalypse Now, these kinds of films. Then you get this shift over to the sort of Reagan um, neoconish era of Hollywood in the 1980s. And um, so, so in other words, these are examples of what you're talking about with with They Live that are it's being parodied in the movie. But these are hard, hard, hardcore, real life examples of what's in the film. Well, you have a number of examples and they live I mean, how uh, propaganda just permeates everything. And you bring in uh, Edward Bernays and uh, the tactics that he used. Edward Bernays was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. And actually, Sigmund wasn't doing so good, but Edward Bernays read Uncle Sigmund's books, and he thought, you know, I think I can do something with these books, and he's considered to be one of the founders of modern PR. And actually, the United States hired him when we fomented a coup in Guatemala. We wanted some good PR on that. And um, so Edward Bernays came to the rescue. And then you also get into uh, Michael Aquino. And he was a, he was in American intelligence. He was a Satanist. And uh, he wrote a book from PSYOP to Mind War. And that book is about not necessarily doing a PSYOP on your enemy, or your enemy's populace. It's about doing a PSYOP on your own populace so you can make them all believe in war. You, I mean... And I just find that uh, pretty fascinating that you would stick uh, Aquino into. Yeah, I, for <clears throat> I forgot in that essay. You're right. I did stick that in there because it was a great example of the what what uh, Carpenter's lampooning or satirizing. Uh, but it's also like you're pointing out very serious because, you know, in that essay towards the end of it, 
in the footnotes, uh, Aquino and his co-author talk about um, signals until, I mean, like using EMF, EMF, ELF, BLF signals to actually alter people's body frequencies. So this is actually a real thing. Um, I don't know if John Carpenter knew about that. I just found it interesting that, you know, the film is about uh, uh, signals and, and whatnot, TV signals and satellite signals and all of that, and and that how that brainwashes us, and that the uh, the Aquino paper uh, just kind of a sort of stating the 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 army's doctrine of psychological warfare at the time, um, and how it would need it needed to transition over into a lot more uh, what they call in their white papers. Uh, there's a NATO document that came out that we covered, I think a couple of years ago. And, and the NATO document on Psy war basically said the same thing. It said, it's time to go beyond thinking about uh, changing people's minds and rather thinking about changing their actual brains. So the, the biological chemistry itself needs to alter. And that included everything from um, the same types of ELF, ELF stuff to microchips, et cetera. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it's becoming a lot more explicit in the white papers and the documents as to what they're really referring to. And I just think that, you know, the fiction always has this amazing, almost quasi prophetic element where fiction will, whether it's books or movies, a lot of times kind of predict the future in a way. I mean, I don't literally think they're predicting the future. I think that, you know, if you think of somebody like Philip K. Dick, you know, he was hanging out with a lot of people from Silicon Valley at the time, and he kind of knew what they wanted to do. And so he would put you know, in his fiction, what they plan to do. And so you get this dystopian fiction as a result. And then in that way, you know, I think fiction can be kind of prophetic. I was amazed that the media and the government sold the Iraq war to 80% of Americans because it was obviously predicated on lies. And those lies were being told almost, in, they were being exposed almost in real time on the internet. But yet 80% of Americans wanted, thought that Saddam Hussein was connected to Al-Qaeda and all right. kind of nefarious things. And you talk about, and they live, uh, that the Pentagon hired uh, PR firm Bell Pottinger and gave oh. them $540 million to show what a menace ISIS was to America. Yeah, a lot of these groups we find out have been, uh, I mean, there's a degree to which the groups are real. They're, they're, they get funding. Uh, of course, ISIS is sort of the continuation of uh, Al-Qaeda and the Mujahideen and so forth. But, um, you know, that's, in the 1980s, uh, you know, they were at the White House with Reagan, where you have the Mujahideen freedom fighters there being awarded and, and congratulated by Reagan. There was movies made of the, the, the Bond films in the 1980s with Timothy Dalton uh, have him fighting alongside the Mujahideen. They even have these sort of Bin Laden-esque characters in the in the film. Uh, I think it's Living Daylights, uh, but it's, it's one of the, the Timothy Dalton installments, which R Rambo as well, Rambo fights alongside the Mujahideen. And then of course we get in a very 1984 fashion, the flipping, Oh no, actually there are enemies and you know, we, we, we messed up and we, we, we did too much now, now it's blowback and all this kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, I think a big part of uh, Al Qaeda Mujahideen and then the creation and rise of ISIS, a lot of it was P PR. A lot of it was uh, media played a big role in that. I mean, obviously there was also, I think funneling of, um, aid and support from Turkey to ISIS uh, throughout the, particularly during the, the attempt to overthrow uh, Assad, we saw a lot of Western support for that, uh, that failed. But regardless, you know, it's kind of the same game pattern I think we see with uh, the CIA funding and aiding and supporting rebels. In fact, I went and read um, one of the talks I did a couple of years ago was Miles Copeland's book, Game of Nations. And in that book, uh, Copeland talks about being in uh, Egypt and in Syria and basically saying, of course, we do false flags. Of course, we fund radical Islamic groups. Like, did you think we didn't? <laughs> He's like, he I says, mean, this is one of our great. He uh, says, this is one of our greatest tools is to utilize the Islamic radical for our purposes. There's a whole chapter on it. So, um, yeah, it's pretty prevalent in the literature. So, uh, yeah, but I've forgotten about that, that, specific amount of money but that's that's wild it's so half a billion dollars there really that's just fine. to help create the image of isis um but uh and then and then the threats 
also become the justification for the uh, salvation that the system offers. So then when they get rid of bin Laden, oh, we'll see Obama's a hero. He got rid of bin Laden and they dumped the body at sea. And it was all just nonsense in my view. You know, even Cy Hirsch writes a big thing talking about how it was all seemingly fake and made up. Um, So anyway, long story short, uh, back to Hollywood and Bernays and all that. Yeah, I remember at the time when I wrote the the second Hollywood book, I wasn't, I'd read Bernays and I'd read uh, Propaganda, but hadn't gone uh, into Walter Lippmann, hadn't gone deep into to Tavistock. I'd read uh, Estelin's book from Trine Day. But then I went and read um, uh, Dr. John Coleman's book on Tavistock, which was actually really good. And he goes into the history of how the same uh, Reese report style of propaganda that they used against the Kaiser to get World War One going that uh, the the predecessor to uh, this Tavistock was the, uh, I forget the name of it, but but it's something that starts with a W, but it's like, it was the Ministry of uh, Warfare that the Brits used to start World War I uh, and say that the Kaiser, what they called him the Butcher, they used the same propaganda calling uh, Saddam the Butcher Baghdad. It was like they mi- literally just mirrored 100-year-old propaganda for from Tavistock or the predecessor to Tavistock. And that's why, as you're pointing out, all these guys uh, like Bernays, like Lipman, they're just borrowing from uh, the techniques of both Freud uh, and H.G. Wells, who was a, a big forefather and, and a pioneer of, of propaganda techniques. Um, and then you see that that gets used in film. Absolutely. In fact, Bernays said that the greatest medium of propaganda the world's ever known is, is Hollywood. And uh, he even made his uncle's books in vogue again. I mean, he uh, he he was a busy guy. And actually, it's kind of interesting. Uh, Joseph Goebbels was uh, quite fond of reading Bernays' books, mm-hmm. despite uh, his Jewish lineage. Well, actually, and Tavistock individuals who were also Jewish were open about their uh, the, being fans of Goebbels, and they they appreciated the the type of uh, propaganda techniques that he was using as well. So there's a lot of cross pollination there in those areas. Goebbels uh, would be if he saw a television today. I mean that that would be his wet dream, which we'll get into a little bit later when you talk about what uh, when I talk about poltergeist. With Ghostbusters, you brought in something kind of interesting: uh, the government tapping into metaphysical forces, and you mentioned Stargate. There was an MK Ultra subproject that was tapping into psychic abilities. And with Stargate, Stargate was financed for 20 years. And then Bill Clinton said it doesn't work. And the military said it doesn't work. So yeah. they ostensibly financed something for 20 years that didn't work. And now there's no more Stargate, but I believe that there is a Stargate <laughs> and <laughs> it's gone black. Yeah, that's that's uh, interesting because I, we just revisited this topic. I hadn't thought about this in many years, but I, I got some of my old uh, SRI and Stargate uh, research out the other day because we did a, po- a podcast covering the uh, recent discussion of gateway process, which is another one of these declassified CIA documents where they... We're supposedly delving into a lot of kind of consciousness techniques and meditation techniques and trying to hit to uh, hemi-sync, which is merge both uh, hem- hemispheres of the brain and see what you could tap into by doing this. And so um, the guy who ran that was part of this uh, Esalen Connected uh, Institute. I forget the name of the, the, the foundation that they were doing this research at, but it was all part of SRI as well. Um, and a lot of the people at SRI involved in that project, uh, you know, come up in a lot of the text that uh, Chris has, has uh, printed at, at Trine Day and that then the the Puharics and these characters who also have a lot of interest in the occult and Gnosticism and quantum physics. So it's hard to know what's real or not real in that whole domain of occult and metaphysics and quantum physics and consciousness uh, meditation techniques. I think there's definitely something there because as you pointed out, what what you get just stubble bind and the creation of the first earth battalion and you and you know the book that ronson writes ministerial ghost becomes the george clooney film so here we get another crossover into hollywood with the very stuff that we're talking about because although i don't i think i mentioned ministerial ghosts i didn't do an essay on it um you know clooney is another character for example who seems to 
pretty consistently have um, direct CIA connections, perhaps even working with the CIA, much like Angelina Jolie being a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So we, we see we always see these patterns. And if you remember in Minister Goats, uh, you know, he, he's doing all these different techniques, the the uh, George Clooney character, like cloud busting with his mind. And he's trying to he's trying to kill a goat with his mind. Um, but but what's, what happens at the end of the movie is that, if I recall, there uh, it fast forwards to present day of Gulf War One, and they're in Iraq and they're figuring out ways to hand out American DVDs and movies to push American pop culture in Iraq. So again, the, the irony is that the the movie be- becomes a sort of a testament to the movie itself being propaganda and kind of you know make bringing it full circle. But yeah, you're absolutely right to to say that. There's quite a few of these projects where the government's, uh, you know, it's not just SRI and Yuri Geller and remote viewing. It's it's quite a few things and probably much more that we don't know about. It's interesting. You talked about Andrew Puharic and he worked at SRI and was, was part of Stargate. And he was a notorious pedophile. He was, uh, he was definitely a very depraved individual. And he was he he was the guy that found or discovered Yuri Geller and Yuri's ability to bend spoons and other things. And but there are accounts of Puharich being like a notorious pedophile. And I knew someone that was well, I still know them, but we don't really talk too much anymore. I said he was involved in Stargate and SRI. And I said, well, how did you guys rationalize using Andre Puharic. Yeah. He's such a, a malignant character. And this guy said to me, well, we knew there was something weird about him. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and with Clooney, it's kind of interesting. You have Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, you have Syriana, and then you have Michael Clayton, which really show some amazing truths. About right. Uh, but then he does a U-turn and doesn't seem to be making movies about stuff like that anymore. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, I did like Michael Clayton. I thought that was good sort of critiquing and exposing corporate power. Um, and then uh, Syriana, I, I want to say that's based on a Robert Baer book. And that would mean then that, you know, that's kind of this uh, supposedly critical side of the CIA, which, which Bayer is kind of a similar character where he'll uh, every now and then he'll say these really kind of uh, uh, revealing things. And then he'll be back on CNN touting the, you know, Russia uh, runs Trump narrative, which is all nonsense in my view. But uh, yeah, so it's, it's hard to know with, with some of these characters, uh, like what, where they're coming, but you know, with Clooney again, you know, you've got, tons and tons of people who that's more speculative in his case i don't think it's outlandish but quite a few people in in hollywood have been actually you know cia assets and i think that speaks to really the where i'm going to take things in the third book i'm I'm working on a sr hollywood three is i'm going to focus a little more on um hard cases and evidences of people who you know were Hollywood spies <laughs> who did work with the OSS. When I was writing the first two books, uh, you know, there's a lot of information that wasn't even out yet. And so, you know, a lot of books, biographies get written, things get declassified since you, you know, you're writing stuff eight, 10 years ago and you learn a lot more about it and you realize, oh, actually, you know, here, there's Ben Affleck in an interview saying that Hollywood and the CIA are flip sides of the same coin. Here's, uh, you know, information that comes out about this studio is actually a front for uh, running an intelligence operation, you know, all these kinds of crazy stories that come out, uh, all of which are true. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, it's sort of like, once you see it, it's like, well, how did I never see that? Of course, of course the CIA is using all these Hollywood people. Of course, uh, you know, you've got people like going back to Julia child or right? the first TV chef, she's comes out of the OSS. And people think, well, why would that be? Well, it's because it's called culture creation. So you mentioned Bernay earlier. Uh, or Bernays, uh, I mean, that's that's really what a lot of these groups do is they want to create, grow, and steer culture, uh, and then then it makes perfect sense why they would have you know assets uh, in Hollywood. And let's jump to a clockwork orange and the droogs. 
you said something pretty interesting that uh, Alex, he was the head droog who was uh, on the homicidal side and that you pointed out, and this was a Kubrick film, and you pointed out that he had endured sexual abuse very early on. And ultimately he went through government sponsored mind control. Give us some insights into a clockwork orange. Yeah, actually, I forgot about that scene where they show Alex and his uh, sort of government CPS handler agent guy showing up. And it's very clearly uh, implies that there's sexual something going on there in that scene where he's standing in his whitey tidies there with the CPS guy or whatever that guy's supposed to be. Um, yeah, this is an, a, a near future dystopia in the UK where uh, basically we have these sort of uh, street gangs running wild. You've got the uh, parental middle class, upper class people. Uh, they're all sort of oblivious to what's going on. They, they really don't care. Alex's parents are, are totally out to lunch. They're just sort of mesmerized by the TV, the game shows and whatnot. And Alex is just sort of this one. He's just sort of a, 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 cre a creature of pure inner uh, animalistic passion. Basically, he just sort of wanders around the town sleeping with whoever he wants. But for, for some reason, he has this uh, fixation on Beethoven. Uh, and and he, he's always playing Beethoven. And after uh, a brutal rape event with him and his gang, he ends up in, in put into this program, which is called the Ludovico Method. And to me, this really just smacks of, again, MK Ultra. It, it smacks of... Um, reprogramming and, and imprinting and 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 the actual fact a lot of the mk ultra experiments were done with various prisoners uh so we had cases in uh kentucky not far from me where they were experimenting on uh, people in prisons we have people in military uh, uh prisons and, and confinement that were experimented on so i think there's some truth to this and and actually i, I read a book uh, a couple of years ago about projects in australia so something i never even heard about some guy wrote a little internet online book is was, was, was a well-written book about mk ultra projects that were done in australia that hardly anybody knew about so mk ultra actually wasn't just a u.s based or even a canada based or it was actually particularly seems to be places within the queen's commonwealth with which i think is suspicious so a lot of canada australia america and uk projects um, but a lot of the, the stuff that we, that you read about in what, what appears to be, uh, MK ultra related projects in Australia also seem to match up very closely to Lud Ludovico method type of stuff. Um, but yeah, so the idea is, can we, can we engineer out of the, you know, wild teenage criminal, uh, his basic animalistic nature and turn him into this sort of just controlled pacifist character, right? And what I like about the film, and I think probably the point of the book too, is that you think that this is done for under the auspices of, you know, reducing crime. But as we pointed out earlier with the, the methodology of Aquino, that research and development, that technique and that study is not just about reducing crime. It's about how to take those techniques and turn it on the population to make sure the population is docile and controllable. That's the key point here. And, and I, you know, and I think Chris has the same idea. I never understood Vietnam until I started trying to understand it from that perspective. And uh, if you read Douglas Valentine's book on Vietnam, he makes the point that really Vietnam wasn't even about research and development for warfare. It was about how to manage population and control population. And that's kind of the ending thesis, because then he transitions over into the Bush era and uh, how the Bush Iran Contra stuff and the School of Americas and all that was a development out of the Vietnam psyops programs. So I think the same thing's going on here with what Burgess and and Clark Orange is talking about is that these are these are these are it's it's an artistic portrayal of the techniques that are done for the excuses of reducing crime and helping society or whatever, but it's all just for for control. What's interesting about Valentine's book um, about Vietnam, the Phoenix program, we're training people, our, our government is training Americans to be serial killers. Right. 
I mean, it's, I don't know how else you can put it. Um, and it, there was a movie called Apartment Zero. And it was about a, a South uh, African mercenary. And he was quite fond of killing people. And then, and, and then all the, the wars dried up, at least the ones that he could be part of. So he returns, he goes to London and lives with somebody. And then he starts killing people because he had learned to enjoy it. And my uncle, he died last year. He was in Vietnam. And he and I had a number of talks about Vietnam. And he felt really guilty about Vietnam. And I said, Al, you were put into a situation, an, a, a highly abnormal situation. And that's a normal response is you want to kill somebody. I mean, they're trying to kill you. They're killing your friends. Um, of course, you're going to want to kill them. And he died last year. And I went to L.A. and uh, buried him. And I saw he had painted paintings of G.I.s standing over dead children. And at that point, I realized now I know why he just couldn't. I mean, he couldn't shake it. It, it haunted him his entire life. Yeah. And really, really sad. Um, and, and we were very close, but he kept that from me. He, I, I just, like I said, I didn't find out about it until, uh, until he died. Yeah. I didn't really understand movies like apocalypse now, you know, like I was telling you earlier, I grew up in the eighties, so I, I didn't really experience or know that kind of stuff from, you know, sixties, seventies and so forth. But, you know, when I was in high school, I really got into film and, and became a movie buff. And I, I watched Apocalypse Now back in high school, but I didn't really understand it or know what the point of it was. After reading Valentine's book and then going back and watching, uh, you know, Apocalypse Now, it makes a lot more sense. And I can understand, you know, you've got not just LSD, but you got this sort of like people going like Colonel Kurtz going nuts. And uh, but he makes sense in the, in the light of a Phoenix program idea. Now, I don't not saying that he's supposed to be the phoenix program i don't know but definitely in the film you get a lot of elements of what was experimental psychological warfare at the time of vietnam like uh <clears throat> well kubrick's uh, full metal jacket for example you have uh, the idea of uh, it being filmed live time uh, that was the first war that was that was filmed they would send the transmissions of the war live um, which was a new, I, I think that was a new experiment in social engineering to, to show to the domestic population war in, in, in live time. Um, you get, you know, the playing of Wagner uh, as the helicopters are coming over the, the, the horizon. Uh, that was another experiment in psyops to villagers who'd never heard something like this. So, and then of course, as you pointed out, yeah, you've got this, this training of, and probably profiling of like like we've said like you know the CIA being involved uh, even corporate consultants going over and being involved it was run out of Michigan University Michigan State which is odd and then they're all they're basically consulting on finding serial killers to go and murder and put corpses in the most uh, you know offensive you know, yeah. terrorizing way uh, particularly with the eye of God and nails in the, in the third eye there to freak out the Buddhists and whatnot. Um, so yeah, you, you basically were training people to be serial killers. This, this is kind of wild. This is nuts. And then you find out, you know, you d dive deeper into people like uh, William Colby and his whole background and his uh, role in Gladio and, and the whole fiasco Operation Gladio. I mean, all this stuff for me just kind of came unraveled with, uh, you know, being sort of a GOP uh, you know, Navy family uh, raised by a GOP Na Navy family. Um, you know, after 9-11, I pretty much just sort of gave up all of that kind of stuff because um, you see you see that these big families are all kind of in the same crime syndicates. Right. So it's not like, well, I'm going to switch from the Bush family to I like the bill. You know, I like Bill Clinton now. Well, they're all involved in, you know, the same stuff. So uh, for me, the good part of all that was that, you know, this kind of broke the, the left right paradigm for me uh, back around the time of, you know, 2003. But that's biographical data. We were talking about the movies. I apologize. I got off onto. We were talking about Ludovico method, and we were talking about. I uh, like tangents. Program. But you know what? Yeah, that's the thing is a lot of movies actually have this theme of the uh, 
you know, the, the, the crazy Vietnam vet. And that's a kind of a joke that people do. And I don't, I don't mind the joke, but the re the turns out <laughs> the reason for the crazy Vietnam vet is that the military was trying to find crazy guys, right. To turn them in, in, into serial killers. And my uncle was uh, just a run of the mill kid from the Midwest. I uh, did well in high school, very smart. And what he was turned into, obviously, was uh, pretty horrific. You tackle Twin Peaks, which I find interesting, and you, you address a number of the occult themes in Twin Peaks, and some of them jump right out at you. But you focus on uh, Jack Parsons when you talk about Twin Peaks. Give us some background about Jack Parsons, a.k.a. The Beast. Well, he was a... Uh prodigious uh, uh rocketeer and scientist i guess you could say and of course the uh jet propulsion laboratory is sort of his baby it's it's it, it comes from his work um he was into the occult and for a time was involved in the circles of crowley the oto and uh, various lodges out in california and his specific plan was this idea that you could meld science with full on, you know, occultism and kind of produce these big ritual workings. And one of those, I mean, I think all rockets are also kind of the, like in his mind, like sending the rocket into space is like this, you know, phallic sort of seminal transmission where you're impregnating the, the universe or something like that. But he also had this idea of the Babylon working, which was to uh, reenact or, or actually create the apocalypse. So for Crowleyans and people in that sphere, they, they tend to think that John's apocalypse at the end of the book of the Bible uh, is this sort of coded magical text that you can invoke through some sort of ritual working. So Parsons uh, uh, was involved in, I think, an incestuous sort of ritual working at one point. And then there was another incident where he thought he could create a homunculus. And so he really seemed to want to take these occult ideas and put them into practice. Um, probably people have heard of L. Ron Hubbard. And I, I think it was, uh, was it L. Ron Hubbard stole Marjorie Cameron from Jack Parsons, right? So, yes. And, yeah, and he also Hubbard stole some money too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm trying to remember all these details. Um, but yeah, so, the, but the, what's interesting about Parsons is that he seemed to take everything that you would think is science and kind of give it this esoteric alchemical meaning. So, you know, the idea of splitting the atom or something like that. Um, I mean, this is not Parsons, but uh, you know, people who have that attitude would think that it's like a ritual working where you're releasing the energy and, and perhaps even opening a portal. And the reason that relates so that you have this, this, uh, this idea that Parsons thought he might could open up some sort of dimensional spiritual portal. And I remember when I was watching twin peaks, I didn't actually, I wasn't actually sure that that's what Mark Frost and David Lynch had in mind. Uh, so I wrote a pretty speculative essay that I put in, I think the first Hollywood book, about Twin Peaks, because I noticed throughout the series, I had to watch it a couple of times to really understand what was going on, because it's a pretty sophisticated kind of deep thing there with a lot of philosophy and a lot of uh, esoteric stuff. And it's also a satire because, you know, David Lynch is kind of making fun of uh, soap operas, which were really popular in the early 90s. Um, but then when you watch it, it's like, well, there's this really weird kind of esoteric stuff going on, too. I wonder what that's all about. And I first encountered the idea that it might be something deeper in the Sinister Forces trilogy where there's a discussion of David Lynch uh, in one of the chapters. And so I thought, well, let me just dive deeper into this and see what I can come up with. And uh, I noticed in some of the scenes that, you know, actually put ritual magic sigils uh, up there on the board where Cooper is doing a lot of his investigation work. And so I wrote an essay basically saying that I, I think this probably relates to the, the Babylon working of uh, uh, Parsons and Crowley and this kind of stuff. And then Mark Frost puts out this big fat book on the history of Twin Peaks and says all of that. <laughs> so I'm not saying that Mark Frost read my essay. Maybe he did. I don't know. But I just thought it was funny to be vindicated because literally in the Twin Peaks history book by Mark Frost, I mean, he goes into Crowley, he goes into Parsons, he goes into the Babylon working, he goes into all of that saying that, yeah, that's really what we were drawing from when we did the mythology of Twin Peaks. So, um, yeah, another example of esoteric Hollywood. Crowley's OTO, that's what uh, Jack Parsons embraced. He, he was a Crowleyite. And um, 
And he helped develop rocket engines, as uh, Jim was saying. And and he was a fairly nasty piece of work, but there's a crater on the moon named after him. Forgot about that, yeah. A crater named after an Alice <clears throat> acolyte. And then he took in a very, uh, I think, shell-shocked L. Ron Hubbard. <clears throat> and uh, L. Ron stole <clears throat> his wife and uh, some money, too. And Oh, and I forgot uh, Parsons also sold the uh, secrets to Israel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he got in trouble for that. <laughs> and what he had his top security clearance revoked like five times. Um, oh, wow. For, I mean, you know, he's a, he's a guy that's quite fond of black magic. I can see how, you know, that could rub certain people wrong. Although I'm, I mean, he always got his security clearance back. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah. But I find it interesting that he, after, El, after uh, L. Ron Hubbard stole his wife and money, um, that he blew himself up. <laughs> yeah. Wasn't this in this, uh, humunculus experiment or what he thought he was going to create some kind of space being or something i forget what, what he thought it was going to do but it ended up blowing up right yeah or do you, do you think there was something else like he was he was killed or i don't know um i could see a guy like that well he was i mean he was a genius with those types of chemicals i mean mm -hmm. without a doubt he was way ahead of everybody did he kill himself uh, or did, was it uh, something gone awry? Um, I do not know, but I can see how a guy like Jack Parsons could have a lot of enemies. Yeah, great point. Yeah, good point. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and what a better way to get rid of him than to <laughs> blow him up. Although, right. Well, he I works in chemicals. Well, he got blown up. Well, it's convenient. <laughs> right. And I don't subscribe to that, but Yes. It's a possibility. Right, right. Let's get into Poltergeist and its director, Toby Hopper. You, you said some very interesting things. And again, we've got a connection with uh, Aleister Crowley because the television, the cathode ray that was designed, and, and the television plays a central part in Poltergeist, a central piece of, it's an essential piece of Polter, Poltergeist. And, uh, and it was developed by uh, someone who was also in the uh, Hermetic the Order. Golden, the Golden Dawn, Dawn guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which, which Crowley was. So we've got some mm -hmm. heavy-duty occult stuff going on there. Give us, uh, Tell us about Poltergeist and what Toby Hooper was, was trying to get at. Uh, yeah, if I remember, <laughs> if I remember the screenplay is Spielberg, and it specifically mentions the beast, but you don't really hear that if you're watching the movie. I had to go look up the screenplay to see what 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 the original intention was. And so the critique there, I think, is that television is the means by which you would have a sort of spiritual uh, toxifying of the youth in particular. Because the, the it's the little girl that's really transfixed by the TV, and she's she's the one that's really having the um, experiences with you know the dead and the spirits and the demons via the TV, and and the rest of the of the family and particularly the parents they don't even notice they're sort of oblivious to what's really going on. <clears throat> um, of course, we have this story that it's built on a India burial ground or something like that, but I, I really think that's secondary to the point of. You know, the, the, the movie is really about, again, similar to what we find in They Live, except that it's pointing out, maybe in, maybe even in a Revelation of the Method way, that the real way that the society and the youth will be sacrificed to the beast, I think is what I said, is via the toxic culture that would come through uh, mainstream media through the TV. And you were talking about the Golden Dawn. It was Crooks, William Crooks, the Crooks Tube. Yes. Uh, is the origin of the, of television, and that's a guy who was in the Golden Dawn, which is a Curly's first magical group before he started the the OT or he, before he joined the OTO. He didn't start it, but he joined. Uh, kind of took it over. Older. yeah, yeah, <clears throat> yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I, that was my reading of Poltergeist. I I hadn't watched it in a long time. Went back and, and watched it, and, and you know, took a lot of notes and paid close attention to it. Went and did a bunch of research on it and kind of what the screenplay was originally intended to be. So. Um, sometimes movies 
go in a different direction than what the screenplay has, right? So sometimes there'll be stuff like the, the beast, you know, that's in the screenplay that's not that doesn't really come out of the movie, but it makes a lot more sense when you know that. What's interesting, the uh, television becomes the vortex, mm -hmm. the wormhole. Well, and uh, what did LeVay say, right? LeVay said that, I'm trying to I'm paraphrase him, but it was something like every home would have a satanic altar and that would be the TV. <laughs> he said something like that, yeah. And you get into MK Ultra at that point again. You talk about John Lilly's uh, work with children as far as being able to make automatons out of children. And he he actually wrote a book about it. Yeah, he's got a book called, uh, what's I've got it over here, it's uh, Programming and Metaprogramming in the Human Biocomputer. And I actually bought that because I didn't think, that I, I was skeptical. I thought surely he wouldn't put that in the book. Man, it's almost unreadable. If you try to read the book, it just most of it doesn't make any sense. I have no idea what he's talking about. Uh, which that could be that I don't know the science of what he's trying to talk about, or it's just he was so tripped out on LSD that he didn't know what it was like. could go either way. Uh, but there is a, a chapter towards the end where he does talk about um, doing this with children, and he claims he was able to sort of – he talks about it as if everything is a program. So he's basically saying the human mind is like a biological computer and that there's these – base layer programs that run like which are your your drives like to eat to sleep and then there's other layers and programs that have been tacked on maybe through uh, genetic memories or i'm going from i haven't looked at the book in many years but something like that like maybe he thinks there's genetic memories that evolved and and are, are in your programming through your ancestors and then there's things that you encountered in your life that that programmed and imprinted you and he thinks that through a lot of lsd and uh, and then and then reprogramming kind of like you and Cameron did with the re-imprinting you can you can wipe the slate and kind of create a new being by tinkering with their base programs and this is interesting because th there's something to this I, I don't know a whole lot about this field but I, I was watching the famous Jordan Peterson course uh a couple months ago the the one that he did that he's had up online for a long time. It's his, it's his full uh, psychology personality course. It's, I don't know, 20, 30 lectures and about four or five lectures. in, he actually gets into this and he uses a very similar type of, but I'm not saying that he does what Lily does. I'm just saying that there's something to this because he starts talking about base layer programming. That is how the human mind functions and so forth. So I think there's something to this. And that leads me to think that Lily is talking about something legitimate but a lot of the book is, like I said, it's really just the, the the terminological baggage is just who knows what he's talking about. But it, it's it's a real book. It's crazy. I mean, it's like, wow. But it, it should. I don't guess it's that far fetched, though, if we know that Alfred Kinsey, you know, he did this kind of stuff to kids. So I don't guess it's that far fetched that that Lily would be involved in doing this kind of stuff. Some Project 136 talks about giving electroshock to children. And, yeah. Um, and then you've got Loretta Bender. She was a famous psych psychiatrist at, at Bellevue. And she was dosing children for weeks on end. I mean, children. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. There's another example. Yeah, so it's not far. Children as young as five or six. Wow. She would dose them for months. And she was being, uh, the Human Ecology Fund, which was a CIA yeah. front, was front, funding yeah. her. So... Who knows? I mean, these are examples that we know about what the CIA has done to children. Yeah. And all, most of that MK Ultra documentation was destroyed. It was destroyed, right, right. But it really shows how sadistic they were, how sadistic they were to children. And I just, uh, when I started reading about this type of stuff, it made me very, very angry that uh, that there was no lines. I mean, the, there's no moral lines. Uh, right. I yeah, mean, it's, a, it's like a mad science thing, right? Like yes. uh, Ma Mengele's idea of science or, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of parallels with, um, well, think back to like, didn't Skinner, Skinner put his daughter in a box, didn't he? Because he thought he could program his daughter, the uh, Skinner box. It wouldn't surprise me. But yeah, there's some story about him like putting his, putting his kids in, in his Skinner box to, to reprogram them. So you're right that... Uh... Hollywood 
at, with all points, we are confronted by phony dialectics, which are essentially false paradigms of opposition. And they are almost always wrong, maintaining only a piece of the puzzle. And when you write about that, you write about individualism versus the collective. And you talk about Hollywood trying to destroy the individualism and make everyone a part of the collective consciousness of the propaganda that's being produced in Hollywood. Could you explicate that a little bit? I'm trying to remember. Uh, is that I think that's in the context of when I was talking about uh, V for Vendetta and how V for Vendetta yes. is yeah. is about uh, you know anarcho individualistic uh, rebellion, but the the way it's presented in the story is kind of like yeah, but in reality we're all collectively uh, Guy Fox or something like that. And so I, I think I was just trying to point out that in my view, uh, anarchism has a long history of. Uh, being a tool as well for intelligence operations and false flags. I think uh, in um, one of the British intelligence writers, maybe Conrad, um, you know, there's this discussion of where the, I think it's British intelligence does a false flag with anarchists or something like that. Um, so I, I, that was kind of what I was getting at. The same idea comes up in uh, the uh, Guy Ritchie, Sherlock Holmes, this, the part two where <clears throat> these anarchists, engage in these bombings but it turns out it was actually moriarty who in the story actually kind of appears to be a british and he's like an oxford professor or cambridge and he's working with uh military industrial complex to arm uh different both sides of the war for world war one uh in the robert downey jr jude law guy Ritchie version of uh, sherlock holmes so I, I always thought that part two of sherlock holmes was pretty revealing in that regard too but yeah that's what i was getting at was just that uh, when the movies give you even the idea of something like the rugged individual or the, the anarcho individual, even that's really just kind of a corporate fraudulent type of rebellion. It's, it's an inauthentic rebellion, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. And you're right. Both cultic groups and government agencies have the desire for control and particularly the control of thought. And one of the most effective groups to achieve this is through childhood manipulation, which, which we were just talking about. And I've got a quote here that I that I like. Uh, there are many, many. Uh, there are many, many problems for positing ultimate reality or the absolute as an impersonal force. If ultimate reality is impersonal and chaotic, then all localized events, phenomena, and objects are also devoid of any ultimate meaning. Language, mathematics, logic, etc., are thus also annihilated as merely mental fictions, or at best, some cosmic force we do not understand. These are servants of chaos and the abyss. So basically what you're saying is that there, you can look at, come at reality one of two ways, metaphysically or materially. And if you come at reality materially, then everything loses its meaning. Yeah, if, if, pure, if all reality is reduced to just pure matter, uh, reductionism, then ultimate reality is impersonal and other things would follow from that too. Like in, in philosophy, there's fancy words like the, the world, the universe would be disteleological. That just means that there's no telos or purpose to it. Everything's just sort of random chaos. So if everything's random chaos, then it follows from that, that, well, my life is also chaos. This week is chaos. Today is chaos. My in it, my arguments, our discussion today is chaos. So essentially, it kind of becomes a, a, a form of nihilism ultimately. And um, yeah, I think I was trying to argue that nihilism is sort of the end result of a, of a lot of revolutionary anarcho philosophy, right? So and it, the same would be, would apply to uh, communism as well, right? So I'm not just just saying that revolutionary philosophy in terms of anarchists are, are problematic, but also socialism, collectivism, all revolutionary philosophies kind of have this, this issue with uh, whether the revolution actually makes sense and has a purpose or a goal. And, you know, if you read Brave New World, he kind of says, well, all the revolutions were for this, 
for Brave New World. We'll say, well, wait a minute. I thought revolutions were about freedom and humanity. And no, no, they're actually anti-freedom and they're anti-human. <laughs> so, so it's like revolutions kind <clears> of <throat> seem to go in that uh, irrational, dysteleological direction. And I was pulling from an argument there that uh, Dr. Philip Sherrard and uh, Father Dimitri Staniloy, a famous Orthodox theologian, they kind of make this point that certain uh, religions posit an impersonal absolute. And if, if all reality is, is impersonal, if the, if the absolute is just a force or impersonal, then you would have this sort of nihilistic end result. What would you call, uh, well, you've got like hardcore atheism, but then you've got deism, which basically says that God made a watch and this is the watch. There are Buddhist schools, like Theravada Buddhism, doesn't believe in a God, but they believe in karma. So, but to me, if you're going, if you're going to believe in karma, you're, you're believing in something metaphysical and incomprehensible, which I think could easily substitute for God. And actually, Immanuel Kant, that's one of his arguments for the existence of God is, is karma. Of course, he doesn't call it karma, but um, so I like your your take on that. Yeah, there's areas of Kant that I like. Uh, for example, I, I believe in what I think is the best sort of logical philosophical argument for God's existence is the transcendental argument for God's existence. And it has some parallels and overlap with Kant in that Kant did a lot of transcendental arguments. He didn't, however, do the transcendental argument for God because Kant thought that all the transcendental categories were purely mental. And so they're kind of mental structuring features that you impose on the world for the raw sense data that comes in. <clears throat> um, I'm not a Hegelian, but one interesting thing that Hegel did was he took that insight from Kant and he said, it doesn't really make sense to think that these categories are grounded in the human mind because the human mind is finite and there's a, you know pretty serious uh, problems in Kant's view. For example, Kant couldn't ever know if other minds operate the way he thought the mind worked because other minds would be, for example, in the realm of the noumena. Uh, that goes outside of what Kant thinks you can know the phenomena. So Hegel says a better move would be to say, that the structuring categories or the transcendental categories that make knowledge possible are grounded in the divine mind. Now, I don't believe in Hegel's view of God or his pol uh, political philosophy. I just, spe I just specifically think that that move that he made is a, a possible solution to one of the problems in Kant's view. And so the transcendental argument for God is basically saying that the transcendental categories that Kant talks about have to be the case for knowledge to even be possible and that God's existence is the very thing that would make knowledge possible. So that's the, the move I would agree with. Uh, as for Buddhism, I'm not super studied in Eastern philosophy, but I think that a lot of Eastern philosophies tend to kind of fall over into to basically viewing reality typically as something illusory or um, they, they tend to sort of embrace a lot of contradictions at times. Um, so to me, that would, that would kind of just negate whether they have the ability in an epistemic sense to justify knowledge. So I always put a high value in my argumentation on whether the knowledge that we have or the knowledge claims can be epistemically justified. And typically, uh, I've never, I had one interaction with a Buddhist guy, maybe three years ago, we had a discussion on a podcast, but, um, it's not it's not a field I've interacted with a lot, but typically they, they don't really care about the kinds of things that people in Western philosophy are looking for, like justified true belief. I think most Buddhists would say, well, we don't really we're not really interested in doing that. I read Hegel as an undergrad and where he completely lost me was absolute spirit hovering over Prussia. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely think that his uh, overall his system is ridiculous. So I don't want to give the impression that I'm a Hegelian. I just thought that one well, move that he makes to critique yeah. Kant is, a, is an interesting insight and actually works for people who do believe in uh, in philosophy. It's Theology is called divine conceptualism. And this is an approach where um, reality is grounded in the divine mind, basically, is, is what that's all about. So with Kant, um, you had the rationalists, and they said that truth can be deciphered within. And then you had the empiricists, 
who said that you can only decipher truth by measuring, by, by external experience. And they were at odds with each other, but Immanuel Kant brought them together. And he said that we have 12 categories of reason and that we have the, this, he called it intuition of space and time. And that these 12 categories of reason have to align with space and time. And, and and that's how we ultimately discern truth. So he was able to bring the rationalists and the empiricists together. And a lot of people have argued that, so Kant is basically saying, and, and I don't know how many categories of pure reason there are, but it sounds like, I, I'm sure that, I, I believe that humans are hardwired. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that Kant is driving at. And in Eastern thought, in many Eastern schools, uh, humans are hardwired uh plato humans are hardwired mm -hmm. and uh and we had chomsky come out and say that humans are hardwired for language mm -hmm. which was kind of revolutionary because it completely overturned what we thought was tabula rasa but when we get into mathematics i've got you know i'm i'm kind of um our our mathematics a truth um there is mathematics a truth i'm a little bit torn with that because i believe i mean the fibonacci sequence mm -hmm. shows up a lot of places in nature right so, so obviously that is mimicking reality the, the fibonacci sequence now with kant he would say he he had what's called an a priori synthetic argument mm -hmm. and uh what he meant by that is uh such truths are known a priori since they apply with strict and universal necessity to all objects of our experience what without having been derived from that experience itself so kant would say that when you're measuring the hypotenuse of a right triangle a squared plus b squared equals c squared he would say that that because that's always going to be that way, he would say that we have knowledge of that within ourselves and that it is a constant truth. And here's my problem with Kant and mathematics. Um, those, when you get into Euclidean geometry, you've got wonderful equations um, that are really simplistic and elegant like the pythagorean theorem a squared plus b squared equals c squared but then einstein came along with general relativity and he showed that straight lines are only in the minds of humans that they, they do not exist in reality and euclidean geometry is predicated on straight lines so wh what are we to make of that well, one way that you could kind of bypass that whole discussion about the status of geometrical objects or whatever would be to, to talk about universals and universal claims, right? So, for example, to say, like, uh, all straight lines only exist in the mind as a straight line would be a universal claim. So even though perhaps um, Einstein wouldn't be interested in revisiting these kind of medieval discussions, the fact that people don't want to revisit those topics doesn't mean that they're not underlying the possibility of predication. So I think that this just brings us back to questions of, uh, you know, the existence of universals, which I think that language, my, I always argue, always argue that language requires it. Um, so we need, we need metaphysics. We need universals. We need universal, universal categories and we can't escape those things by, you know, the Kantian move to psychologize it or the skeptical move to uh, basically say that there's only particulars like David Hume or something like that. Um, all of those positions end up being kind of destructive to the possibility of having knowledge. So, um, so I would just say that we can broaden the question beyond the status of math or geometrical objects to return it to the question of universals. And there have to be universal categories. And the only way to have a universal is to say that there's a divine mind that houses the universals. I would agree with that. It's interesting. I uh, wrote a book that, or co-authored a book that brought in Kantian thought 
Um, and um, I, 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 there were two other co-authors and they weren't really familiar with Kant. So I was the guy that kind of carried the water on that one. And um, I didn't realize you were a philosophy guy until today. So I, I just knew of you as kind of the, you know, the journalist. The guy you know, that writes that. about job yeah. trafficking. <laughs> well, I am somewhat multidimensional. That's cool. But Kant is, if you look at his critique of pure reason, I mean, it's a TKO in the first, like, five pages for most people. It's probably the most esoteric book ever written, except for maybe uh, James Joyce. Uh, Ulysses, you know, or, or, yeah. Finnegan's Wake. Um, but I became a Kantian um, to a certain degree. I mean, I, I see where his thought is problematic. But I incorporated Kant into this book that we wrote, and what was interesting, and which kind of gives you an idea that, you know, I have pretty good working knowledge of Kant. And I was going out with a woman who had the critique of pure reason on her bookshelf. And, <laughs> wow. I, um, and I started to page through it and I started to read it. And then I realized, you know, if I continue to read this book, I will not know Kant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more amazed that you you were dating a woman that was into. I've never heard of a of a woman into con. That's interesting. So, uh, Jay, I really want to thank you for coming on the Nick Bryan podcast. You've been a great guest. Thank you. Yeah, I want to have you on, and we can get into some of your work as well. I didn't mean to to uh, pigeonhole you as one dimensional. I just didn't know that That's you all right. were into those other topics. I didn't. I don't mind being pigeonholed. It doesn't really <laughs> bother me too much. Have yourself a great night. All right. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Take care, Jake.